The new series is God's Name for His Children. Now, a couple of years ago, we did a series about God's own names. You know, God has over 70 names in the Hebrew Bible. And we, I picked out my favorite. But don't forget, God also has names for you. He's got lots of names for you, and they're wonderful names. Like he calls you soldier. He calls you ambassador. He calls you Israel. He calls you disciple. But more than anything, he calls you beloved child. And as we go on, we're going to talk about these different names, these different ways that God feels about us and thinks about us. Isn't that interesting to think of God as having emotion and God as having daily thoughts, that God is looking at you now and he's watching you, but he's watching you with adoration and, and love, the same way that a mother or father would look at their child. I want you to know that you are loved. So today we're going to talk about some of these names. Now, if I've learned anything in my life, learned anything about myself, um, names have power. The names we give ourselves, the flags we fly, the names we give our places, names have deep meaning and power in our lives. Throughout my life, I have been called lots of names. I've had all sorts of nicknames. In fact, about 10 years ago, I was going through a name crisis because all of my nicknames started catching up with me. My first name that I was born with after my grandfather and father is Robert. This is a name I don't use very often. It's the one on my driver license from college behind me. That lets me with kind of long hair. And it's an official name, you know. When I was called Robert by my parents when I was a kid, it meant I was in trouble. And then, you know, as you get older and as a kid, you know, Bobby became my nickname. This is me, Bobby, when I turned 10. Same age as my daughter. Look at me, all tan. Loving California. Living the life. It was clearly a pool party. And then later when I went to, to college... I switched to Robbie. I felt like it was a little more manly. My friends in hockey had called me Robbie on accident. I just sort of went with it. And so when I moved to a new state to go to college, I'm like, I'm Robbie now. Meet Robbie. And then I, I started dating this beautiful girl named Hannah who had a cousin named Robbie who she was close to and was uncomfortable kissing a guy named Robbie. It's like kissing your cousin. So she said, we got to find a new name for you. You can't keep going by Robbie. And for a brief time in history, you've probably forgotten this, Hannah, I went by another nickname for Robert that a lot of people don't know, Bo. Now, there are only a handful of people who called me Bo in my life, and it really didn't last. And when we moved back to California, I had forgotten that I had all these friends here and family who would called me Bobby my whole life and refused to call me Robbie or Rob or Bo, and they were like, it's Bobby. So I was like, you know what, that's good. We're going back to Bobby. It's a true crisis. All jokes aside, we carry all those names for me have different when someone calls me Robert, Robbie, Bobby, Bo, any of these things, they invoke memories and feelings of my past, of sort of who I was in the timeline of my life. Maybe you have some names like that in your life, and some of them are good memories, maybe some of them are not great memories. When I was a kid, I also had other nicknames. I had a coach who called me Lionheart. Even to this day, when I think about that, it means a lot to me, that he, he saw that personality trait in me. I met a girl named Hannah who started calling me Babe. I met a couple of kids who, to this day, still call me Daddy. These are all real names. When I was a kid, too, and even as an adult, I've had other nicknames, too, that weren't great. I had uh, a guy that called me Scarface. I've had people call me a clown. I've had people call me an F-up and a loser. Maybe you've had people call you these types of names in your life. Somebody calls you a loser, an F-up enough times, you start to believe it. At the end of the day, the only name that matters is the one you believe in. You've had 10, 20, 30, 100 names that parents, friends, enemies, people at stores, people online have called you. And one of these days, some of these days, you look in the mirror and you embraced some of those names, the good ones, the bad ones. But this is important, that we understand that there are names we have that cannot be taken from us, that are given to us by God, that when we put faith in those things, we become them. I believe that when God sees you, 
you know, when you, well, God sees you now, but when you see God face to face in heaven, I just think there's going to be an incredible moment where he calls you something like beloved son, beloved daughter, and it's going to mean the world to you. And I think that so much of being a faithful disciple to Jesus is not waiting until we get to heaven to hear God call us by that name. But to now, not only understand in our minds, but believe in our hearts, in our bones, that this is what God calls me now. This is what God calls you now. And to put your full faith and belief that God loves you so much, that God is cheering for you, that God has not given up on you, that God has great plans for your future, and that God intends for your future to be much better than your past, and to trust that he's not angry at you and judging you, but he's on your side rooting for you as a father or mother would root for their child. God is rooting for you and is on your side. He's with you. Amen. So it's interesting when you read the Bible, you see name changes all the time. And usually it's God doing the name change. God loves to change the name of places after important events happen there. God loves to change the names of people. Off the top of your head, you can probably think of a lot of Bible characters whose names were changed. Abram, which means exalted father, becomes Abraham, the father of many. Jacob becomes Israel. Jesus changes Shimon, which means the obedient one, Simon. He changes his name to Peter. But there's only one person in the Bible I can think of who God didn't change their name. They changed their own name. And he wrote most of the New Testament. His name is Paul. Saul in Hebrew is Shaul. He goes from Shaul to Paulus. Paul's story is an amazing one. Paul's parents uh, were born in a, a zealot city called Gashala. Zealots were, I don't, I don't want to go too far off here, but zealots were these, these people in Jesus' day who were militant theocrats who used violence, treachery, and things like that to try and engage in a type of guerrilla warfare to get occupiers out of Israel. And Paul's parents were like this. They were these zealots both of them. His father was a Pharisee and they grew up in this Gashala city and they were a part of this major event called the tax revolt, which is a major issue for, for the Romans. And during this time, uh, his parents were arrested and, and as the Roman custom was, they were sold into slavery and were sold to a Roman citizen in the town of Tarsus. Now think about that just for a moment. Paul grows up a Roman slave his master maybe wasn't too bad because after Paul's master died, he manumated his parents, freed them. And when that happens in the Roman Empire, you go from slave status to freedman's status and you're actually a Roman citizen. This is how Paul gets his, Shaul, I should say, Saul gets his, his freedom. And so Saul now is this, this guy and he, he becomes a Pharisee and he studies under Gamaliel. Gamaliel is considered one of the greatest one of the greatest rabbis in Judaism, to say that he studied under Gamaliel. Imagine you met an astrophysicist physicist today, an old astrophysicist from Princeton, and he said, I studied under a guy named Albert Einstein. You, you'd think that's pretty amazing. When Paul says, I was a disciple to Gamaliel, it's like the same impact in his day. The, he studied under maybe the greatest teaching rabbi in Judaism even today. Um, an important part of all sorts of rabbinic documents. But anyway, this is a, but, but Paul is, Gamaliel is, is kind of like Jesus in the sense that he taught his students to love their neighbor. Gamaliel said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself, quoting the Torah. And he even said that your neighbor was the Roman occupier. Now, I don't think Paul believed that. Paul studied under Gamaliel, but Paul seemed to struggle with this bitterness, this dislike for Gentiles. And you see it in his, his origin story, this like just, in fact, when he's on his way to Damascus, we know that Saul, or who becomes Paul, we know that Saul is persecuting the church. And one of the chur first churches he's going to, to, to persecute is one in Damascus. Damascus was known for inviting Gentiles into this Jewish Christianity that is sort of blossoming. And we know that Saul sort of just hates this. And it's on that road to Damascus 
that Jesus knocks him off of his horse and covers his eyes and scales and says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul has this amazing conversion experience, spends some time in Jerusalem, and then goes to Arabia to be trained. Maybe the most vocal supporter of Gentiles coming into the church and and becoming God's people. In fact, his first convert is a man named Sergius Paulus. You might hear something in that name, huh? Sergius Paulus, who was a proconsul to Caesar. This is Paul's first convert, Sergius Paulus. Proconsul is like saying he was the secretary of state, maybe the number three, number four person in power. Hugely influential. Sergius Paulus comes to faith, and it is then that Shaul changes his name to Paul. Why did, he, why did he choose that name? Look, all these other Bible characters, God changes their names. You know, God, God changes their names to, to, to some new meaning. Do you know what Paul ne- means in, in Greek? It means short. Short. And this adds to the fact that Paul himself was short and bald. And Paul embra- chooses a name, short one. Why? Despite the pejorative nature of the name Paul, he picks Paul because it was his first convert. Paul decides to make the calling of his life his name. He chooses this name, Paulus, to remind him that the reason he is here on earth is because God forgave him and sent him to bring the Gentiles and even people of influence into the kingdom of God to be world changers. I think that Paul believed that that old way, that old pharisaical life of bitterness and anger and legalism and the harm that he did to so many people, he would never be that man again. He would be the man that Jesus made on the road to Damascus. He would become Paul. Although he's short and literal, he's a man of power and his calling, his calling is the thing that drives him and the thing that makes him wake up in the morning. I am Paul, God has a name for you. Maybe when you look in the mirror and you see all the things you don't like about yourself, you remember all the stories of your life that you're really embarrassed about. You think of all the things you feel guilty about, all the ways you don't fit in, or you're not like this person or that that person. It's easy to embrace those really horrible negative names that others or maybe you yourself um, said to you. And I want to say to you that God has, has such an awesome name for you, as it says in Revelation, as Hannah read this morning. He says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious, that's you, I will give some hidden manna. That means he's going to sustain you and nurture you. And I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. I want you to believe, as Paul said, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You are free. And I just want to speak over you the things that God thinks about you. That you are loved, that you are a conqueror, that you are great, that you are victorious, that you are righteous in his name, that you are justified, that the path before you is good and not evil, that you walk by faith and not by sight, that you are a person of power, an influencer, full of light, full of love. You're a leader, and people need people like you. And I'm so proud, so proud of you. I'm so happy for you because I know that so much good is coming in your life. You are so, so loved. I'll just finish with this. Every single week, we say this creed, and sometimes it's kind of hard to believe. We always say, I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. Man, the world says the exact opposite. You are, you are what you do. You are your stuff, 
and you are your reputation. And we just, we just cast that idol down. In a time when you can't do anything, it's hard not to feel kind of worthless. There's very little we can do right now that's productive in the world's eyes, but there's a lot we can do that's productive for the kingdom, like pray and love our neighbor and grow deeper in our friendships and our relationships and commit our lives in ministry to God. Um, it's easy to think I am what I have, and most of us have lost a lot. We've lost a lot financially. We've lost a lot of progress that we've made in our careers or projects. God loves to turn tragedy into triumph. He is someone that's going to change. He's going to turn the story around. You're in the middle of the book, not the end. And I just believe that, that if you are able to not be so, like I, like I am, not, not get too worried about what you've lost, you're going to see God bring new things in your life. I just want to say none of us have gone through this before. This is really hard for everybody. And everyone is going to respond in different ways. And I just want to encourage you that during this time, you, you relax. Like, and, and you be careful. Be careful not to give negative names to other people because you feel frustrated. During this time, the more gracious you can be, you'll be just like cool water to a thirsty person in the desert. To just be an encourager. You're, and that's who you are. You're such an encouraging person. And, and that's, that's who the world needs today. They need someone like you who's not going around judging and getting all angry, but somebody who's super encouraging. And I'm, I'm so grateful for you. Friends, we are all in this together alone, aren't we? That's kind of a way of thinking about it. We're all alone, but we're not alone. We're separate, but we're not divided. We're together. And I just so love that things like this have made available um, for us to gather as a church virtually, for us, for us to worship together as a church. Remember, you are God's beloved. No one can take that from you. Amen.